Question 51. A 1,000 par value bond with 6% annual coupons matures in two years. If the required rate of return on the bond is 11%, then the current yield on the bond using simple compounding is closest to. So we'll pull in our current yield formula here. So we'll take our annual coupon and then uh, divide that by the current price. So our annual coupon is going to be pretty simple. We'll take that 6% by the par value. So our coupon is going to be 60. And then current price we are not given in the formula. So we're going to need to derive that from our um, time value money calculation on the calculator. So let's pull in the calculator here. Um, for our N, we're going to have two years. So we'll go two for N. Um, our I is going to be that 11% required rate of return. Uh, payment will be the same as our annual coupon, which is 60. And that future value is going to be par, since that's what we mature at. Uh, so we've got a thousand there. So we'll compute our present value, and we've got minus, or we've got 914.3738. So this is this is what we're going to put in the denominator of this formula here. So let's pull in that answer here. We can see we've got 60 over that 914.37 uh, gives us 6.56 percent. Answer C. Question 52. If a firm enters into a repo agreement to sell a 5.75 10-year bond with a par value of 1 million and a market value of 980, 980,000 for 945,000 and to purchase it 120 days later for 955,000 then the repo margin is closest to so our repo margin is going to be amount loaned divided by the market value um, so our amount loaned is going to be that 945 since it's telling us that uh, we're selling the repo agreement uh, par value and then it says we're selling it for that 945 so that's going to be the amount loaned market value is going to be um, given right here as well and so we see that then we subtract one off that so we've got 945 over 980 minus one gives us three point uh, five, minus 3.57%. So we'll go with answer A. Um, a lot of these other numbers thrown in here, the 955 and the par value, are really just kind of thrown you into, thrown in there to throw you off. So we've got to remember this formula here um, of uh, amount loaned over market value. Answer A. Question 53. Which of the following statements is or are most accurate? So we've got those two statements here, and then the answers are some combination of which one is accurate or inaccurate. So um, let's look, take a look at these statements. So statement one, for a lender, loans with higher loan-to-value are less risky because the borrower has more to lose in the event of default. So higher loan-to-value um, means that they're loaning more money out to the borrower based on the asset of the value so a higher loan to value if you had uh, take out a mortgage and you put down 20 percent that's going to be a 80 percent loan to value for the bank if you put down 50 percent that's going to be a lower loan to value since they're only having to put up 50 percent of the capital so building on that example um, higher loan to value is going to be more risky since the borrower has less to lose in the event of default. So we can cross off statement one, um, and then coming down here to our answers, we can cross off anything that's saying one is correct. So we can cross off B. So now we need to determine statement two. Um, mortgages to borrowers of lower credit quality or that have a lower priority claim to the collateral in the event of default are called prime loans. So prime loans are going to be good borrowers, so they would normally have a higher credit quality um, or we would have a higher priority claim. So this would be what we would call subprime loans. So statement two is also not accurate. Um, so we can cross off A and go with C. Both statements are inaccurate. Question 54. In which of the following situations would the issuance of a deferred coupon bond be most appropriate? 
A, when financing a new project. Uh, this sounds promising. Um, deferred coupon bond essentially means that we're taking out the debt, but we don't have to pay the interest or the coupon until a much later date. So if we're taking on a new project, this could be especially helpful because we're not going to have, um, we're likely not going to have revenue or profits coming in at first. So if we're not having to make interest payments while we have no revenue or profit coming in, um, that's obviously going to be a positive. So A sounds promising, but let's uh, make sure we can rule out B and C. When there's a predicted increase in market interest rates, um, this is certainly a good reason to take on debt now um, and lock in a lower rate. Um, but it's not really a uh, reason that really involves the deferred coupon um, portion. So I think we can go ahead and rule that out. And then C, when there's a predicted decrease in the market interest rates, if we're expecting rates to decrease, we wouldn't want to um, lock in rates now. So we can go ahead and cross that off too. We'll go with A, when financing a new project. Question 55, which of the following is most likely a form of external security-based financing predominantly issued by lower, large high credit corporations and generally matures in under three months? A, secured loans. Secured loans are going to involve collateral, um, which is going to be an internal enhancement and typically longer term. So we're going to go ahead and rule that out. Um, B, commercial paper. This is essentially describing what commercial paper is. It's going to be um, financing issued by um, large high credit corporations. And they're typically using, these are corporations that have a lot of cash flow. And so the financing is going to be based on them having the cash flow to repay that. Um, and they're using these this cash to kind of fund operations in intermediate terms when maybe they're in the process of paying their suppliers or vendors or um, working on collecting funds from um, their customers. So this is um, probably going to be our answer, but let's just go ahead and make sure we can rule out C. Euro commercial papers. Um, this is going to be internationally focused, which it doesn't say anything about here. And they're going to be uh, smaller denominations. So we can go ahead and cross this off too. So we've got B, commercial paper. Question 56, which of the following tranches most likely has the highest priority in receiving the repayment of the principal amount from the collateral in the case of a collateralized mortgage obligation? A, support tranche. A support tranche is going to support <laughs> the uh, PAC, PAC tranche, and it's going to absorb certain risks like contraction or extension risk. Um, so by virtue of being below the PAC tranche, we can probably go ahead and rule this out since it's not going to be um, a higher prior a high priority. B, floating rate tranche. So on the floating rate, the coupons here are going to be set um, based on LIBOR plus some spread. And they're going to be collecting, this is, they're going to be collecting interest, um, not really principal. Um, so we can probably rule this one out, too, as not being a high priority since um, we're focusing on the repayment of principal. Um, and then C, planned amortization class. Kind of right in the name there, amortization um, implies that there's going to be some amortization schedule for the principal you're receiving back. Um, so think about a mortgage loan, for example, being on the other end of that or being on the paying end, you're paying some principal towards the mortgage every month. So if you're on the other side of that, um, you're the one receiving the principal. So that's kind of what this is implying here. Um, so we can go with C. Question 57. Bond A's yield and yield spread increase by the same amount. From this, we can conclude that the increase in bond A's yield was most likely caused due to... So we've got A, microeconomic factors like credit risk and liquidity, B, both macroeconomic and microeconomic factors taken together, or C, macroeconomic factors like expected inflation and the real risk-free rate. So basically we need to decide whether it's microeconomic um, and or macroeconomic that's kind of causing this change in yield, yield spread.
So the key we're going to be looking at here is um, yield and the yield spread increased by the same amount. So this is implying that the yield spread is really driving the source of the increase in yield. So for example, if the yield was 5% and the spread was 2%, um, and they both increase by 2, that would imply that the yield is now 7 and the spread is now 4, or uh, yeah, 4%. So nothing changed with the underlying, it's more the underlying um, that the spread is measured against, it's the spread of this specific bond. Um, so from here to kind of determine whether it's microeconomic or macroeconomic, the if it was going to be macroeconomic, there would likely be some indication of the benchmark rate changing. Um, which would mean that the yield spread is staying similar um, or the same, but the benchmark rate is going up. So in that scenario, the yield could have been 5 and the spread was 3 or 2, let's say, and now the benchmark rate is 5. So if our spread stayed the same, our yield would then be 7. Um, so that being said, if we don't have anything related to a benchmark rate shift, um, we're going to be going with microeconomic factors like credit risk or liquidity. And so these are two factors that could cause the spread of an individual bond to uh, increase. Um, and so just to kind of build on the macroeconomic, you know, this is kind of something where maybe it's the Fed increased or decreased interest rates um, that is then kind of making that benchmark rate move around. Um, and they're doing that in... Um, in response to some something going on in the macroeconomic environment. So, long-winded answer there, hope it makes sense, we'll go with A. Question 58, a 1,000 par value 5% semi-annual coupon bond has a Macaulay duration of 3.59 years. Which of the following is most accurate? So we've got two statements here, and then we need to determine whether um, each of them is accurate, so only one or only two, or whether both of them are accurate. So statement one, if yields increase by 100 basis points, then the bond's price will rise by approximately 3.59%. Um, so this is going to be incorrect. If bond yields increase, our price is going to decrease by that amount. Um, so we can rule out statement one, which means we can cross off A. So now we need to, oh, we can actually cross off A and B. So we know that statement two must be accurate. <laughs> but uh, that's a good way to save time on the exam. But let's go ahead and take a look at number two statement. If yields increase by 1%, so this is the same as 100 basis points, the bond would need to be held for approximately 3.59 years before the decrease in price would be offset by the gain in reinvested coupons. Um, this is basically the exact definition of um, Macaulay duration, so that's going to be correct and we will go with B. Remember Macaulay duration is going to be this definition, whereas modified duration is going to be used to measure changes in price. Question 59. Based on Porter's five forces analysis, which of the following is least likely to influence the profit potential of an industry? Um, so as a reminder, Porter's five forces are essentially power of suppliers, power of customers, um, threat of substitutes, threat of new entrants into the industry, and rivalry of existing competitors. So given that, let's take a look at these answers. So A, we've got intensity of advertising campaigns. Um, that could potentially influence the profit potential of an industry given one of our uh, um, forces is rivalry of existing competitors. We'll leave that on the table for now. B, threat posed by potential new entrants. This is pretty explicitly one of the five forces mentioned. C, collective economic power of customers. Um, power of customers is certainly important since 
if our customers have more power, that's going to decrease the amount of profit we can make. If we have more power over our customers, then we're going to be able to increase profits. Um, so ultimately, we are going to go with A. You could kind of make the argument that this would fall under rivalry of existing competitors, um, but it's not quite as explicitly stated as the other two um, answers are for the Porter's Five Forces. So we'll go with A. Question 60, which of the following is most likely true regarding a call option replication strategy only? Uh, so that keyword only is something we'll want to keep in mind here. So A, at option contract inception, borrow at a risk-free rate and then utilize the proceeds to buy the underlying asset at a price um, at the option inception. Um, this sounds promising since we're replicating a call. Um, we know we're going to want to go long, so we're going to be we're going to want to buy the underlying asset there. So that's key, and we're going to need to borrow in order to buy. So A sounds promising, but let's go ahead and make sure we can rule out B and C. B at contract inception, lend an amount equal to the option's exercise value at a risk-free rate and sell the underlying at a price at the option inception. So this is gonna be going short where we're gonna to wanna to be going long and this is essentially describing um, put option replication strategy. So we can go ahead and cross out B. C, the replication strategy requires adjustment over time depending on the likelihood of option exercise. Um, so this is true. This is where it gets tricky because this is true regarding call option replication. Um, but the answer ultimately goes with A because this can be applied to both puts and calls. Um, we're going to have to be making adjustments no matter what replication strategy we uh, are doing. Um, so since it's call option only, we will go with A.